thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I know it's been a long day and you probably heard a lot of interesting topics today and you're going to hear even more interesting topics tomorrow. But I appreciate you came here to, to actually listen to us a little bit and to understand a bit better how football can be uh, the force for good, um, how football can change the communities and lives for children or those who are in need. We have great speakers today. We became almost friends <laughs> last couple of uh, minutes. I want to introduce Jan, Aisha and Ross, who came here today all for you to explain and to give an idea how Football Club Barcelona, Premier League and Clubu, which is actually the organization working with refugee co and communities around refugees, changing the lives by providing them the equipment, the knowledge, and everything what's needed to get football into their lives. So thank you very much for coming again. Um, by the way, I'm representing Avery Dennison, who is official partner of Names and Numbers for Football Club Barcelona, Premier League, and some other clubs and leagues in this world globally. So we do all these beautiful embellishments you can see around me and around <laughs> Jan. Um, but it's not about us today, it's about these guys and the great work they're doing. So we start with Football Club Barcelona, I introduce Aisha, please a couple of words, uh, words and we play a video around you. Okay, so hello, can, can, is it, yeah. okay. So my name is Aisha, I work in, in FC Barcelona Foundation. I'm the head of uh, Partnerships, Innovation and Knowledge. And uh, I see that you are with your phone, so I'm going to ask a question. Who likes football? Okay, only you? <laughs> um, so I want to thank you, something, because, because of the reason that you like football, you're doing a great, great thing, um, supporting the clubs and the leagues and other organizations that use football as a tool for development. So this is something that we are going to, to talk today with, with my colleagues. Um, I work in Barca Foundation for three years, and this foundation, um, this year is the 25th anniversary. Uh, we work in three strategic lines. The first one is prevention of violence. The second one is social inclusion, and the third one is education. We, we, what we do is use a sport as a tool to achieve these goals. Um, and I want to show you a little video about uh, in what we believe. It's coming in a second. Hello, is anybody there? Can you hear me? We want to give you a very important message. We're changing the rules of the game. First, the pitch. It doesn't matter if it's not rectangular. If it's not level. Or if we have to mark it ourselves. The world is one huge pitch. All that matters is that there's a ball. Or something like a ball. Two, everybody can play. And everybody means everybody. Including her and him. And them. An amazing team. <laughs> Three, we don't play against anyone. We play with them. Alongside them. Without violence or fear. If our opponents fall. We help them get back up. If they miss, we'll cheer them on. And if they score, we'll congratulate them. Because we're all friends. Four. The score doesn't really matter. We win by having fun. If we learn, we win. We beat exclusion. We beat injustice. We beat sadness. And most of all, we win our right to be children. And five, these rules aren't just for playing. They work at home, in the street, at school, and in life. Always. Because if we change the rules, Everything changes. Great video. Thank you. Hello. Is anybody there? Can For you those who didn't capture, <laughs> we'll try to repeat. Okay. Thank you very much, Aisha. Yeah. And then just a few words to Jan representing Klabu. Um, this is the organization, as I said, who is working with refugees. He also has a short video, and I really want him to speak a little bit more about the work he's doing together with his colleagues. Thanks. 
Um, yes, so my name is Jan. I'm from Amsterdam, 34 years old. Um, it's super exciting to be here because Klabu only exists for five months now. And I'm sitting together with Barcelona and the Premier League and Avery Dennison. So you can imagine that I perhaps dreamed about this. Uh, I did dream about this three years ago because I had a totally different life. I was a corporate lawyer in a big law firm, actually the biggest law firm in the Netherlands, drafting uh, agreements for t uh, takeovers of big companies. Um, and after four and a half years of that, I got inspired by um, an internship I did at UNHCR, the refugee agency. And I experienced myself the force and the power of sports for refugees and mainly for children and youth. And that was the moment that I saw that there is a big need for sports, especially in refugee camps far away from here, far away from the microphones and the cameras in the world. So I set up Klabu, which means club in Swahili. And what we do is we build sports clubs in refugee camps. Um, we launched our first club in Kalobe, which is in the far north of Kenya. No one will have ever heard about it. Um, there are 36,000 refugees from 13 different countries uh, that live there. And on average, you should know that a refugee is in a camp for 17 years. 17 years. So if there's nothing to do, you know, sports really helps them to rebuild lives. So we launched our first club and we build a campaign around it because we also, as a business model, we um, build their identity and a collection of sportswear around the club. And this is the uh, sportswear um, attached to the first, linked to the first club, Calobe Spirit. Um, really proud to wear it. It's also for us a fundraising tool. And the ambition is that we become the brand of sportswear that empowers others to do sports. So that's why we uh, launched our first campaign. And perhaps this is a nice moment to show a short video around that campaign. Do I have a way design or third? <laughs> so you have uh, the home kit. Uh, okay. I have it's the away home. kit. Um, and it's very nice that we are here because Avery Dennison, without Avery Dennison, we wouldn't have made this kit because they provided us with the badges and the trims. And everybody who buys this kit, it's available, um, always looks at the badge first and says, wow, this is real quality. And that makes me really proud. So perhaps we can show. Yeah, thanks. So uh, perhaps one uh, short other thing is that this is our first club and we are now uh, working on partnerships to build many more. So we're talking to Bangladesh, to Rwanda, to Ecuador. There is a huge need for sports clubs that are community led, led by the people in the camps. We just enable them. So that's a great opportunity for you if you want to work with us, Barcelona, Premier League, Avery Dennison. So that's why I'm also here. Thanks, Jan. And uh, last, well, Premier League never can be last. <laughs> so last but not least, Ross, please. Thanks, Evie. So, um, yeah, my name's Ross McKinley. I'm the school's programs manager at the Premier League Charitable Fund. I suppose it's actually slightly misleading, maybe, um, because I work for the official charity of the Premier League. So we're a, a sort of corporate charity, a, a grant-giving charity that supports football clubs, 
in England and Wales, um, not just in the Premier League. We've, we've found 105 different, different football clubs um, throughout all of the divisions to do their community work. And I suppose the, uh, the reason behind um, sort of getting involved in all of that is that we are absolutely aware and we know that football has the ability to change lives. Uh, and we know and we have a responsibility as the biggest league in the world, or certainly one of the biggest leagues in the world, to, to sort of harness that and to utilise the sort of the inspiration that can bring to young people to help them realise their potential. Sometimes it's, it's working out what their potential is as well. Um, but then also I think um, inspiring people to sort of give back to their community. So we do that by, by grant funding and we can, we can work with our clubs to go out into their local areas and, and provide inspiration and activity. But I think one of the, the keys to making football as a force for good and as a sustainable programme uh, is, is making sure that young people know that, that football is a community and it is an environment and making sure that they all have the ability to, uh, to give back to their community somehow, whether that's their school or their team or their, uh, you know, the places where they play in their street or just their community environment more generally. So um, a, a sort of a bit of a sense of scale, like I mentioned we, we fund 105 different football clubs. We work with approximately half a million young people a year um, through our, our club network. Uh, but I specifically look after all of our schools programs and, and some of them you may have heard of, some of you may, may not. So um, I'm going to show you a quick video in a second about our, our project called Premier League Primary Stars, which is our sort of uh, primary or, or elementary school program linking uh, academia and physical education to, uh, to football. Um, we also have a secondary school program that tackles sort of mental health in, in young people and support that schools need to provide. Um, and we know that from local government funding that's, that's being reduced, so where we can offer support there. Um, so I think it's sort of worth just highlighting, um, which you'll see in the video, that actually what we do is, is really simple. Um, we offer sort of activities at the right place at the right time to meet that local need. Um, and so the video you'll see is, is actually from some work that one of our football clubs, the, the Saints Foundation, um, delivered linking mathematics to, uh, to football. Thanks for taking my comment to speak a bit slower. <laughs> I know that was good, actually. Thanks, Ross. Okay, now the video. I like football the best, and I like where they score and like all that stuff. When Mr. Kilby started the school, he um, started to help us playing football and to learn our skills. What is our topic today? Who can remember? Lizzie? How to shoot. I really like it, but I thought Mr. Kilby does with us. My behaviour was bad. I just didn't like going in the class and doing my work had a lot of behaviour problems, said there was no point to school, said that learning things wasn't going to help him at all. When I don't have a football to play with, I just get angry. When he found out that Southampton Football Club was coming in, he was very excited. We work alongside the teachers as well as the pupils, and hopefully what we'll do is we'll be able to improve attainment within the pupils, but as well as engage them in their PE and in the classroom elements as well. Mr Kilby coming into a classroom wearing that badge on his tracksuit has a massive impact on all the children involved. He sits with me and just helps me do my work or my one-to-one -one helps me. So at the moment we're looking at different shapes and he learns through football so what we managed to do is we've taken something that Dylan likes and he's now showing me how it is on the whiteboard um, and he's doing very well. Mr Kilby approached me and asked if we could put maths um, into the PE lessons as well. And what that's done is it's engaged the pupils, um, and in particular Dylan. So what he's done is he's naturally a good goal scorer, so he would score lots of goals. So how I've done it is if he scores, he's got to come to me, answer one of the questions to claim that goal. So I get goals, celebrate quick with my friends, and then come over to Mr Kilby. Straight away Dylan would say, that's the answer. He'd get the goal and he'd be the happiest child out there. It was really, really good to see. He's really trying now in all of his lessons. He has got an incentive and he knows that uh, people believe in him. We do teamwork, resilience and challenge, because we challenge ourselves. One of the nicest things I've seen was in the Mother P lessons where he knows he's, he's doing well in his football and he used that as, the, as a way of working with other boys and girls to help them get better. Um, I help my friend Joss so, so much and 
I just really like him. He's been helping me do so um, stroke and offence. His first goal was a penalty, but he, he got our team won for the match, didn't you? Yeah. He won our team the match. Over the course of, of the time that I've been here, what I've seen is him really work hard at it to progress and get better. I got better at my times tables, maths. At class now, I really concentrate. Started doing my work, listening to the teacher, and then just getting all in my brain stuffed up in my brain, and I really like it. Yeah, he's, uh, he's certainly a bit of a character, is our Dylan. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, I think we I all... like football the best, and I like where they score and like all that stuff. When was the kill we start? If you like the guy, yeah, we're gonna run it again. But I think we all wish we could have learned math the same way, right? It's way more exciting. So thank you for introducing this method, by the way. So just a few questions before we ask the audience around what they would like to know about you and the programs you are doing. So in the in the principle to build the community and to the work you are doing around the communities, was it what, what it's really in football which is making the difference? What, why not other team sport, let's say? What do you think is really different in football to, to help the community? Um, so I think for me, you know, sports um, per se, but, but particularly football is, is, is so inclusive. Um, it's so simple for, for people to get involved with. You don't need a huge amount of equipment. Um, you know, one ball and you can you can do the rest. Um, and so I think, you know, football has the ability that, that anyone can play at whatever level. And, and that, I think, is one of the key that, uh, you know, the key ingredients for us to use as a, as a Premier League through our, our club networks, um, really to sort of try and instill the values that, that team sports bring and, and, and football particularly. So, so all of the work that we do at the, the, the Premier League have, um, have our values instilled into them and they are um, being ambitious, being inspiring, being connected and being fair. Um, and all of those, those values you get by being in a team. And if you can couple that with the ability to play football in the street or in a playground or on a pitch or in a stadium, then actually you can do anything. Thank you. And then if we, okay, so we have a ball, yeah, it's, it's the first thing. What do you think about the kit as the next <laughs> important element as we think is important, but how important is it in the communities you serve and you are getting in touch with? Um, well, to answer that question, you know, in refugee camps, obviously, uh, people don't have a lot. So the clothes they wear are just given to them. And it's often, you know, if they are lucky, they find an old Messi shirt or an old Salah shirt or a Van Dijk shirt. But mostly, they just wear whatever they get. So women, they just wear oversized T-shirts. And those might be cool here, or in Amsterdam at least, but they're not For there. Sure. And by making a kit, we designed it together with them, uh, together with the people there. We asked them, what should we, uh, what would you like to see on the kit? You know, giving it a name, Calabé Spirit, it gives a s sense of belonging. Like, hey, I'm appreciated. This is my club. It's actually the first time in a, in a camp that they feel like that they're proud and that they want to be there which is very strange. So this is a very powerful tool. And it's not only there, but it also connects across borders. Because here, we are turning the story around. Instead of seeing refugees as helpless victims, we are seeing them now as the true people they are. The people that are really good at sport, that are you know, amazing, in, as you've seen in the, in the video. And we are their supporters. We are wearing this because we want to be part of Calabé spirit. Instead of them wearing an old Messi shirt, we give them the new shirt and we are their supporters. And that's something, we are in touch with them through WhatsApp. They report on this every day. They have Facebook. They share everything we are doing here. And they are so proud. So the kit is super important. It makes the entire story tangible. Thanks, Jan. Very inspiring. Okay, and then you all three been in this process for quite a while. I think 
you, you have a lot of wins with the programs you put through, but I'm sure there have been a lot of roadblocks to actually bring to life all the different ideas, great ideas you have. So can you give us some very personal examples? What, what, what is your obstacles? What is your life like when you try to implement the program? Um, I know you've, again, you've been in this process for a while, so you probably have quite some interesting examples. Okay, in, in our case, um, who knows Barca? Not so many people. Who knows Barca? <laughs> ah, okay, a little more. So um, um, it's, not a, it's not a stupid question. Well, maybe yes, but um, it's a question about the power of attraction. So we find that uh, our brand attracts children to, to come to the, to the program. But uh, we realized um, in the years we've been uh, developing our programs that the important thing, obviously the brand is, is very important, but the important thing is the program, how you develop the program, the things you give, in our case, children, because they are our beneficiaries. So this is one of the most important things is how we use a sport to achieve the goals. Um, sport per se, it's amazing. Uh, it's good for health and, and mind and, and so on. But if we want to achieve, um, if we want to prevent violence, if we want to make children get included into the, the society, for example, in terms of, of refugees, we need to give them uh, football or sports as a real tool. That's, that's one of the things we found uh, uh, during the years we've been developing our programs and our partnerships. I think it, this is, if, if you're going to develop some program, uh, use a brand, obviously, but also make your program very, very good uh, in design and in implementation and obviously evaluate what you're achieving. That's Do you want me to go next? Um, so, yeah, I suppose my answer to the, the question of what Roblox is in place sort of comes back to where I began, I suppose. And um, growing up, I wanted to be a teacher in a, in a school. And so, PE teacher, I should also add. Um, and as I was going through my sort of university life, we, you know, we had the opportunity to go and do work experience and those sorts of things. And, uh, and I went back to my school and very, very quickly appreciated that teachers are incredibly brilliant people. Um, and I was nowhere near that good. So uh, so I quickly sort of went away from that and, and, and started to get involved in um, in other areas. And where that ultimately led was um, when we began, actually the primary school program, the, the program that you saw, saw Dylan taking part in, um, we went out and did some research. We went to various cities around, uh, around the UK. And I remember being in uh, Wolverhampton in the Midlands and uh, we went along to speak to a, speak to a school and, and just observe what they were doing in um, physical education in PE. And uh, and no word of a lie, they were doing star jumps behind their desk, and that was the extent of their PE lesson. And we sort of we delved a bit deeper. We had some conversations and we spoke to teachers and sort of said, you know, where and how did you pick up doing star jumps as being an adequate way of, of delivering um, a fit and healthy lifestyle and, and learning through through sport? And, uh, and the answer from the teacher was, we haven't. Going through teacher, teacher training in the UK, uh, you do a two-year course and the, the minimum mandatory requirement is about six hours. And so you get your six hours worth of training and then you're expected to go and be able to deliver for an entire year to your class in physical education. And what it led to is, is the understanding that actually teachers need a huge amount of support, particularly in physical education. Lots of training in English and maths and all of the other, other examples. Um, but PE, which is something that we hold so dear to our hearts, um, because you know, if young people are fitter and healthier, if they've got a love of exercise, then they're more alert, they're more awake in school, their concentration is better. Um, academically, you achieve more if you are fit and healthy and you enjoy sport. And if that was the level of teaching that, that our young people were getting, and it sort of panicked me a bit. I've got an 18-month-old son, and if he, when he goes to primary school, if that's what they're doing, I'm going to be mortified. So where the, the sort of program came from really was about thinking what do teachers need the most and responding to that local need. So we built up a, a program where we train our football club staff um, to a level of a teacher so that they can go into 
a primary school and work alongside a, a teacher which we know is underconfident, underprepared, underskilled potentially in terms of their knowledge of, of how to differentiate or how to assess young people. And we can do that with them and we te team teach and we work together so that when we leave that school and, and the football club goes on to work with a different school, we've left something behind, something that's a bit more sustainable um, that allows you know, better teaching, more active young people moving forward. Thanks, Ross. And I think, Jan, you would have plenty. <laughs> Just pick one. Um, oh, yeah, I had plenty. I mean, leaving a law firm to start Klabu uh, wasn't uh, perhaps the message my parents wanted to hear. Um, I went from a nice salary to zero. Actually, I've been DJing three years now at wedding parties to earn my salary. Um, and I still am because I'm not earning anything through Klabu yet. Uh, so perhaps that could be a roadblock, but actually the one I wanted to mention is we work in uh, refugee camps far, far away from here, and we are not there every day. We do visit, we do connect, so we are on WhatsApp with them. And that is very nice because WhatsApp, you know, works, um, but it's, you, know, you also have to trust people who are there, who manage the club, and at the start that was quite hard because we transfer money to them and then they organize tournaments, they run the club, uh, but we had to trust them with the money. Actually, it was my money as a start. Um, but that went really well because they take so much ownership, it becomes their club, their Calobe spirit. And now Bangladesh, Rwanda, Ecuador, we're going towards there and we're going to do exactly the same. So something that was a bit scary at the start, trusting someone else, in a refugee environment with money um, turned out to be really good and effective. It's impressive how you put your own money on the table for that, seriously, and uh, too bad I'm married, uh, otherwise I would call you for my wedding. <laughs> Who knows? Well, anyways, thank you very much, very exciting stories, and last question from my side. It's probably more for Aisha and Ross, because they are part of very big organizations, yeah? Very exciting, very big part. And no doubt, after what we heard from you, you are a force for good in the teams you are working with, a force for good. But how do you feel about the rest of organization, including players and all the business people within your organizations? Are they really engaged? Do you feel like personal attention to, to the problems you raise, um, is it on the level of personal involvement? I'm not saying they should put their own money straight away, but at least they should put their own time maybe. I'm, I'm coming also from big American organization and I will tell you every Danielson is being promoting this work for the local communities and a lot of people are very much engaged, including myself. So I just want to hear what's going on in Football Club Barcelona and in Premier League beyond your department? Um, so in Barca Foundation, we work um, as a different organization than the club, but we use the services of the club, human resources, marketing, commercial, and so on. So at the beginning, uh, you ask, obviously, for, for services. You need uh, legal services. You need uh, marketing services. and. Um, sometimes it's a little slow because there are other stuff that is more important than foundation, like uh, hire, hiring um, um, a player, for example. Um, but we've done a very important work of communicating internally what are we doing and the impact we are achieving. So how many, children's, how many children are benefiting for our work which is not only our work as foundation, it is our work as Barca. So telling the people and communicating internally what we are doing is making that when I send an email to someone from marketing, I need to, to, to make this uh, design, uh, they put foundation the first. So this is something that it's not uh, done in a, the first day. It's a day by day work, communicating and telling them what we are achieving. Um, and now, for example, the club is uh, taking the, the, the Christmas campaign uh, as uh, a social and community um, uh, purpose. So we are telling not only the, the, 
the workers of the club, but also the fans and, and, and the, the Sofios um, of, of Barca, what we are doing, it, it's, it's, it's having an impact on, on the others. And if you don't tell uh, anyone, no one knows. So you have to tell and tell and tell. And to be honest, um, when I told you uh, at the beginning of, of this, of this uh, moment, um, thank you. Um, I mean it. Uh, thank you because if you support football, um, you are supporting other things. You are supporting um, good things that are happening in our case to children, or your case to children or people in need. Um, so this this thought uh, is in the minds of the people of all the club. In in our case, for example. Yeah, and I I would echo everything. Um, that's just been said. We work in the same way um, as the, the Barca Foundation do at the Premier League. So the, the Premier League Charitable Fund um, uh, use resources from the Premier League as an organisation for you know HR and finance and IT. Um, and our, our clubs do the same. So each of our football clubs have a, uh, a charitable trust or a foundation, um, and, and they work closely with their own club. So so I would I would agree with with everything. Um, I suppose to sort of come to your questions you mentioned about players and how players get engaged. Um, you know, clearly they're, they're really, really important. Um, the Premier League is, is shown in 192 of the 193 countries around the world. Can anyone guess the one that isn't shown live? Any guesses? Shout them out. North Korea. North Korea, yeah, exactly. Um, but we know North Korea is a football mad country. Um, you know they they play uh, you know an extremely large amount of it, both at, at young people's levels and in adults. Um, so football and the players and the clubs and the brands um, have that big attraction. I think what's really key from the work that we do, um, uh, sort of in the community space, actually, is that uh, you know I specialise the, the projects that mainly I run is is with very young people. Young people are generally too small to really know the players unless you are Harry Kane or Messi or Ronaldo. Um, so where we get the real traction is our club staff and our club staff that go into schools and they're there every single week or in their community setting at a, a local council estate where they might be a, a mini pitch that they play some games on. They are there 52 weeks a year. They're the people that... Um, you know that the the young people that we work with aspire to be like because it's that bit more tangible. That said, you know where our, our clubs are brilliant um, is engaging their players to to really do those special events, those celebrations, that time to uh, to really be able to sort of attract new people to that um, to that group. But but when we talk about the idea of football being a force for good, it's it's really the consistency of approach and the, the high quality teaching and the high quality coaching and learning that can go on. Um, that I think really makes the difference. Thank you. I'm even more proud to be part of this panel now. Thank you very much, guys. So I just want to turn to the audience if anyone has any questions to our participants. Anyone? Okay. Not really. So I have a couple of more, actually. If, if one, anyone has anything to ask, just raise your hand. I probably will see you or someone will help me to see you. And we, we just turn to you, okay? So, Jan, what are other non-governmental organizations you tried to work with or you're already working with which are supporting this, like, single-man effort? Okay. Well... Um, I'm very proud to say that it's not any more single men to start with. Um, I mean, we have great partners such as Avery Dennison, and we're talking to the big boys because what I don't want is that Klabu is that nice, sympathetic, uh, small organization uh, with that guy that quit his job to, uh, to DJ at wedding parties. I mean, we want to make a real difference. We want to build clubs all around the world, and we can only do that by partnering with the big guys. So, um, and that doesn't include only companies, but that also includes NGOs. And perhaps the most important one is the UN Refugee Agency, uh, UNHCR, um, that has opened and is opening doors for us. And super impressive because they um, get so many requests from all over the world, uh, the United Nations. 
But when I asked them and I said, you know, I'm very ambitious. I want to find a solution for the lack of sports opportunities in refugee environments. And when we're done in refugee environments, let's go to favelas. Let's go to townships. You know, let's find all those places where sports are not, uh, cannot be done. Um, and they said, you know, the last thing you should do is partner with us because that will take such a long time, it will become bureaucratic. But because you are th that ambitious person, you should work directly with the people on the ground, with the refugees. So what they did, they invited me to Kalobe in the north of Kenya. They b built a program for me to meet them without them asking for anything in return. And now they are opening doors to Bangladesh, to Rwanda, to Ecuador. Um, it's amazing that a big organization like that supports what was a one-man show and is now becoming something a bit bigger. Thank you. Any specific non-governmental organizations you guys want to mention you really partner with, so we just would know? Um, in, in, in our case, we, we have a partnership with 39 organizations of different levels. Um, the most known and, and uh, important for us is UNICEF uh, because of the partnership we have with them. And in our case, we aligned all our partnerships uh, on sports for development, this, this United Nations concept. Um, and uh, for example, in, in the case of UNICEF, um, what we did, or what we are doing, is try to give more evidence uh, uh, to, to, to the sector about how a sports contributes to development. Because all of us, we've seen it in, in children's life. We've seen your video, your video, uh, the, I the impact of sport, but there's not enough evidence, a uh, measure about how it works. So what we're doing together is to understand, to read, to, to ask how it works and what works better in order to, to give this information to all the organizations that can get this information and make better programs on this. Yeah, and I think from, from our perspective, I mean, the, the biggest set of, of NGOs, I guess, is our, is our clubs. Um, and I think the, the key when we work in partnership, partnerships are so, so important to the Premier League. Yes, on a sponsorship and a, you know, a marketing level, um, as you will see across the, the stadiums on a match day. But, but from a, a community perspective, probably even more so. Um, we're a small team. You know, last year we gave out £39 million, pounds, um, about $50 million, to, uh, to the clubs and, and through our programmes um, to be able to sort of try and generate as, as much sort of good work as possible. But that's not just us sat as a team of nine in uh, an office in Baker Street in London. Um, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, what we do is we work with our clubs to pilot everything to make sure that everything that happens on the ground is needed, it's going to be of sufficient quality, and it's going to meet the needs of, of people that are out there that, that need the support. And, and I suppose some interesting examples um, when we look at our primary school program is, is actually about the subject experts that we work with. So again, it's, it's not myself and, and my colleague Joe who, who looks after the program that, that sit there and go, let's think of some English games to play that link to football. We actually work with the National Literacy Trust in England um, or National Numeracy for our maths work or uh, the FA, do, you know, do a huge amount of support for, um, for the Premier League in terms of the, the way that they can support and train our coaches up to that standard that they need to be to be able to really make a difference. Um, you know, we work with the PSHE Association. So, you know, actual subject experts that are sort of um, able to create um, activities and resources, we just add the football bit, which, which really is, is the bit that captures the, the minds and the hearts of the, the young people we work with. But it's the, it's the context that it's put in. It's the, the subject specialisms that, that really make the, the difference, I think. Okay, thank you very much. I think the magic number is 39. You work with 39 organizations. You probably need to round it to 40 at some point. You, you <laughs> don't know how many <laughs> emails I receive each day. I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> for okay. a good cause. Huh? Yes. So just one more time. I'm going to call for any questions. Yes, please.
Hi, thanks for having this conversation. Um, we're with Soccer Without Borders. We've been an NGO doing this work for about 12 years now. And um, you know, we are the partner on the ground that's, that's delivering the work in, in different locations. And, and one thing that has been challenging to see over the last 12 years is that the inequality in football is actually growing. And so the NGO sector that is, is sort of the, benef the beneficiary of these foundations cannot possibly grow fast enough with, with these numbers, even with 39 million, 39 partners, to keep up with that. So what is the conversation? How are your foundations actually trying to shape the corporate side that, that represents you know, less than 5% of philanthropy? How, how are you shaping their business model to try to say, hey, this, this problem is actually growing faster than we are ever going to be able to solve it? So what is, what is the relationship that you have, particularly Barca and, and Premier League, to shape and influence the corporate side of the entities you work with? Um, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, and, and I suppose it sort of comes from where the makeup of the Premier League started. You know, it's, an, it's, a, it's a football competition, first and foremost, um, governed by the, the 20 teams that are in the league at the time. They are equal shareholders. Um, and they... Uh, and they alone really um, sort of send sort of the money down through, you know, through the, the charitable fund. Um, but but I think you're right in terms of, you know, there are significant numbers of, of brilliant organisations out there doing some unbelievable work in this space. And, and I guess um, in terms of sort of how the, the clubs operate, um, we have a, a very, very strong due diligence process uh, whereby um, every year the clubs are submitting documentation around um, everything from their business plans to, to their policies, to their safeguarding, to their risk management, to um, we you know audit their accounts. We, we do everything that um, we believe should be done by um, reputable charities. And without passing that, uh, that sort of due diligence, then none of our clubs get, or th that particular club wouldn't get any funding if that was, uh, if that was particularly the case and one of the things that we've noticed over time is that uh, that the percentage of uh, revenue by that was given by the, the Premier League charitable fund to each of the clubs is, is changing so um, at a time when the the Premier League's broadcast cycle was was increasing exponentially um, the, there was, a, I believe, an over-reliance on Premier League funding for football clubs to be able to administer community programs more generally. And so uh, we've had to work quite hard with the clubs to make sure that they um, they broaden their own horizons, if you like, and don't, you know, they're, they're not solely reliant on Premier League funding to make sure that's the case. So leveraging local partnerships with um, local authorities or uh, other local organisations that can support the work. And again, it comes back to sort of the point I was making earlier about partnerships are, are really, really key. We don't want to replace what is already going on out there. Um, and in fact, if we can complement it, then, then even better. But we certainly don't want to be um, you know, working in territories where the, you know, there is really brilliant provision already taking place. Um, and, and so I guess it's a, it's a conversational aspect more than anything else, really, around making sure that our clubs are aware of, of what is going on in their local environment, but also how we can work with other organisations um, to, to really sort of uh, complement and, and sort of uh, w you know, work together on that. In, in our case, um, there's some information that uh, someone, so, some of you may, may, may not know um, in terms of how we fund, uh, how the foundation is funded. Um, so the club is giving us the 0.7% of the, of the revenues. And the players, all the players are giving us the 0.5% of their salaries. Uh, this right now, uh, the last year, represent the 50% of our budget. The other 50% comes from foundations and, uh, and other companies uh, that support our programs and uh, our, our implementation in, in different countries. So our idea is to, to not, not be so dependent from the club and try to attract other brands, and we also have due diligence and, and compliance uh, processes to, to try to, to have this, um, uh, this amount of money bigger and bigger. Um, we work with, with uh, in our program, so we have, we work in different ways. We work uh, through, all, uh, through partnerships with uh, different NGOs, uh, I said 39, but also we implement our own programs. There's another department, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not in this department, but these programs are implemented by grassroots organizations that we identify 
uh, in the um, in, in on the field, uh, and these organizations are very important for us. How how they work, how they um, they know how to use a sport as 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 a tool, um, and for us it is very important also to, as you 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 said. Um, you're in, co in the coaches uh, area. For us, the, the trainers are very, very important. Uh, one of the things that came from the research we, we've done with UNICEF is the importance, the, the huge importance that uh, trainers have in the programs we're, we're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, did it answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions so far? Well. If not, I think we're running out of time, right? So I just want to thank, first of all, you, the audience, yeah, for coming here, for taking part in this force for good movement that football is trying to make. And obviously, thank you to you guys. You're great speakers, by the way, because you speak from your heart. And uh, as I said, I'm very proud to be part of this panel today. So thank you very much. Um, I'm wishing you very exciting evening and the day two of this event and uh, if any other questions you can find us with the jerseys i know jan has uh, same for other speakers so it will be easier to identify us thank you very much thank you